behalf of the Friends of the Sterling Road Library, we are delighted to welcome you to our second lecture series presented by Dr. Robert Watson. This past September, Dr. Watson presented the series Women and the White House, which was a big hit with the audience. This three-part lecture series will feature discussions on three of Dr. Watson's recently published books. Today's topic is the Nazi Titanic, the incredible untold story of a doomed ship in World War II. Next Wednesday, the 15th, he'll discuss his book, The Ghost Ship of Brooklyn, an untold story of the American Revolution. And then on March 22nd, he'll speak about his just released book, George Washington's Final Battle, the epic struggle to build a capital city and nation. And that book is available if anybody wants to purchase it um, at Amazon and Walmart. Um, this series is sponsored by the Friends of the Sterling Road Library. To find out more about the Friends membership and upcoming programs, please go to our website sterlingfriends.org. The presentation will be approximately one hour with questions and answers to follow. Please keep yourselves muted and submit your questions via the chat box at the end of the presentation. And just to let you know, these presentations are being recorded and will be available on the Friends website at a later, I guess tomorrow. We are so fortunate to have such an exceptional and distinguished scholar on tonight's program. Our speaker, Dr. Robert Watson, is an award-winning author, historian, political commentator, and community leader, who also who currently serves as distinguished professor of American history and director of Project Civitas at Lynn University in Boca. Dr. Watson has published over 40 books related to history and politics. Several of Dr. Watson's books are available in the Broward County Library System and for purchase on Amazon. In addition to being a professor and author, Dr. Watson is a media commentator and has been interviewed on CNN, MSNBC, NPR, the New York Times, and many other media outlets. Dr. Watson has been a visiting scholar at such historic sites as the Truman and Ford Presidential Libraries, Illinois Holocaust Museum, the National Archives, Smithsonian Institution, the Pentagon, and Mount Vernon, among others. Dr. Watson regularly lectures at libraries, museums, historic sites, and lifelong learning institutes. And at this time, I'm so pleased to introduce Robert Watson. Thank you, Rhonda. And thank you to the friends of the Sterling Road Library. Thanks, Hannah and Marilyn and everyone, Fern. And uh, thanks to all of you su for supporting uh, one of our local libraries. I am a library nerd, uh, self-professed, proud bibliophile, so thanks for supporting our libraries during these difficult times. And um, Rhonda, Hannah, Marilyn, and everyone, thank you for putting on these uh, programs for the public. I want to give a special shout out. I saw several friends of mine as I was quick, quick trying to click through. I knew Karen would be here again. And uh, I saw uh, Roberta and Donna, and Marilyn Blitz, and Bobby Simmons, and uh, I saw Sandra, my adoptive Bubby. So I saw a lot of friends here. So <laughs> thanks for coming on. And, and if I forget anything, uh, Karen, just pick up for me and, and take over the lecture. So I have a lot of friends here. All right, with that, let me share my screen. Oh, I see Sarah also. Hi, Sarah and Ken. Um, so uh, with that, let me share my screen. And I have one heck of a story for everybody uh, tonight. Um, so um, in my uh, soon to be 59 years on this planet, even though I only look like I'm 30, um, I have never come across anything like I'm, I'm, I'm going to share with you. Uh, to know. Oh, I saw Roberta just clicked on. Okay. Hi, Roberta. Um, so in my time on this planet, I've never come across a story like this. This is uh, possibly the most shocking historical story uh, I've ever come across, and I'll never have a book quite like this again. So um, I'm excited to share this story with you. So every year uh, around the end of the year, around the holidays, 
I always put together about five ideas for a new book. Why five? Because invariably I'll have a great idea, but my literary agent will say, that's a terrible idea. Nobody will buy it. <laughs> uh, so I don't do it. Invariably, I'll come up with that, what I think is a brilliant idea. And then I'll hear that, you know, Doris Kearns Goodwin or Ron Chernow or David McCullough is working on a similar topic. So why bother to even write that book, right? Um, I'll also come up with an idea for something I think is exciting. But if I can't find enough primary sources. I need lots of diaries of the individuals involved, not just the leaders, but some what of the soldiers and common folks. Um, listen, if, just listen. Uh, somebody have to uh, mute their, uh, your, your, your uh, mic, there we go. Um, so oh, I saw my friend, uh, Maestro Marshall Turkin is on. Maestro, good to see you. Um, so um, invariably, again, if I can't find enough primary source documents, I need newspaper accounts, I need military reports, I need the diaries and letters of the people that were there, both the politicians and generals and the, the average folks. So if I can't find enough, I won't write it. So even if I come up with five ideas every December, one of them will only, well, only one of them will, will turn into a book. So the second thing I do as a preface to this story tonight is um, I'm very nerdy about my history, as all of you have probably figured out from our series a couple of months ago, or those of you that know me. Uh, and as an historian, I made a list of goals 30 years ago when I started my career. I wanted to write a book on all what I consider the major events. I wanted a book on the Revolutionary War. Check, did that. I wanted a book on George Washington. Check. A book on Harry Truman. Check. A book on Abraham Lincoln. I wanted a book on the Civil War, which is coming out this summer. I wanted a book on World War II and I wanted a book on the Holocaust. So that was my goal was to not be a narrow, narrowly focused historian, but to write on what I consider to be all the definitive events of uh, the last couple hundred years of history. So I was working on a book on World War II. Now here's the problem, of course. How do you write a book on World War II? It's such a gigantic topic. And in, you know, forests have been felled to fill the pages of the books on World War II. So I thought long and hard about it. And I came up with an idea. Eureka, people have missed this. Here was gonna be my book, the final week of World War II in Europe. Uh, because the final week of the war was just chaos. The Nazis kept unbelievably meticulous records, which is why we can write so much detail about them, but not in the final week of the war in Europe. They were too busy dying running for their lives and committing suicide. The British kept meticulous records as well, but not in the final week. It was madness and chaos as they were rushing to Berlin and uh, the records are, are, are sparse. So I was gonna start at April 30th with Hitler committing suicide, a cyanide pill, a uh, bullet in the head and his body burned in the Reichsgarten, the, uh, uh, the trifecta, you might say. And I wanted to start at April 30th with Hitler's suicide and go for about a week or so until VE Day, Victory in Europe Day, uh, a couple of days later. And I, I was going to try to cover what happened each day in that final important and chaotic and mad week uh, in world history. Now, that's still a pretty big and ambitious uh, topic. So what I thought I would do is each day I would tell one story of love and one story of loss a story of triumph and a story of tragedy, just to bring this momentous event down into one personal example of each for each chapter. So maybe against all odds, a couple survived from a concentration camp and got married after the war. Maybe a baby was born in the last days of the war. Maybe uh, an, a, a Nazi and an American or a Brit met and didn't kill one another. Who was the last soldier to die in the war? That's the kind of stuff I wanted. So I was digging around for these wild stories of love, loss, triumph, and tragedy in the final week, and I came across a letter. Now, here's your history story for the day, your history lesson. I came across the letter the way history is usually discovered, and that's by dumbass luck. I wasn't looking for it. I tripped across the letter. It was by a British major named Till, T-I-L-L. And Major Till wrote in this letter that of all the horrors in the war, everything that he witnessed, nothing 
nothing prepared him for watching thousands of POWs and thousands of Holocaust survivors all die in the final moments of the war. And I read that and I went, oh my goodness, right? I never heard of that. So I was saying off camera earlier to Rhonda and everybody with the friends of the Sterling Road Library, I said, I go to the source. So I literally called the US Holocaust Museum and asked to talk to the top people. I called the World War II Museum in New Orleans. I called Yad Vashem. I called the Imperial War Museum in London. And I said, what is this event when thousands and thousands of POWs and Holocaust survivors all died when the war was ending? And they all said, there is no such thing. And I even had people hang up the phone on me thinking I was being disrespectful or it was a prank call. So I'd call back and I'd say, don't hang up. You know, I, you know I'm in a story and I, my books have won awards, uh, you know, blah, 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 blah. Everybody either hung up on me or said, this never happened. So I thought maybe the letter was a crank. Maybe I, maybe, you know, who knows what? So I put the letter aside and went back to my research. And guess what? Lightning struck twice for a second time. It's almost fate, everybody. For a second time, I'd stumbled across another letter. This was by a British general in charge of the 6th Commando, a special forces unit. His name was Mills Roberts. And Mills Roberts said, I was on the Baltic coast, north central Germany, and I watched thousands and thousands of POWs and Holocaust survivors all die in the most gruesome way imaginable as the war was ending. So now I had two letters. So I knew it must have happened. I went back and started my phone calls again, and everybody said it didn't happen or they never heard of it. So what I did was I wanted to prove that this was real. So as you all know, you can find out if you had a grandfather or somebody who fought in World War II, you can find out every American or British unit, what battles were they in, the names of the soldiers, you know, and so forth. So I tracked Mills uh, Roberts unit, the sixth commando through the war all the battles year after year. But guess what? When I get to the final couple days of the war, all the records disappeared. So then I went to Major Till and I did the same thing. I tracked his unit through the war. And guess what? When I got to the end of the war, the records disappeared. Now, that meant either A, that was one hell of a coincidence. B, they were all abducted by aliens, but you know, that's not the way I roll. Or C, they must be classified, and this event must have happened. So I called, again, uh, the Holocaust Museum, and I called the Imperial War Museum in London. And I realized if the records were classified, they'd probably be in the National Archives in England. They're, they're royal archives, similar to the U.S. National Archives and Records Administration. So I called, and I said, I think... I found one of the biggest stories of World War II and the Holocaust. And of course, they thought it was a crank call again. And I couldn't get anybody to take it seriously. And I said, no, let me tell you what I found. And nobody would talk to me. So I'm really, really frustrated. I'm spending weeks trying to dig up this story. I even contemplate breaking into the Imperial War Museum like Tom Cruise in Mission Impossible and floating down from the ceiling or Nicolas Cage in National Treasure and steal the stuff, only I'm about twice Tom Cruise's size, so the rope would break and that wouldn't be good. And my kids were applying for college, my son was applying for college at the time. So I figured if I was caught breaking into the Royal Archives, it wouldn't help his college admissions. <laughs> so I'm really frustrated and I'm lecturing for the 70th anniversary of D-Day in uh, France. And I meet a woman there around my age, uh, you know, a very youthful late 50s. Her name is uh, Deborah Oppenheimer, and she's super cool. She's an Academy Award winning filmmaker. She's smart, attractive, kind, accomplished. She, she's just amazing. So I'm talking to her and I say, can we, you know, have dinner? And I said, I hope you don't mind, but my family's here. And she said, I hope you don't mind, but my parents are here. I said, no, let's all have dinner. So to preface this, uh, I used to give a weekly lecture for Florida Atlantic University, and they would have anywhere from about 500 to about 1,700 people attended. And in the very front row of this lecture, there was an older couple named Eric and Gloria Oppenheimer. 
Uh, he was in World War II and a Holocaust survivor. She was a kinder transport survivor. Anyways, Deborah walks in with Gloria and Eric. And I look at them and I go, Eric and Gloria, what in God's name are you doing in France? And they said, we're here for your lectures. And I thought, oh my goodness, you hear me every week. And then I look at them and I go, no, wait a minute. Deborah is your daughter? And I go, what kind of Jewish mother are you that you didn't tell me your daughter won the Academy Award, right? I mean, come on, I would be telling everybody. And then uh, Deborah looks at me and she goes, you're that guy that they listen to all the time and they buy his books. And I'm like, yeah, they got to get out more socially. So Deborah says, they love your books. Tell me about your new book. So I told her what I just told you about the Nazi Titanic, only in great detail. And I said, I know this happened. I know it. I just can't get access. And she says, let me make a phone call. I know Prince Charles. I know Dame Judi Dench. I know Sir Attenborough. <laughs> and I'm like, OK. And I'm, I'm thinking she had too much wine. Well, sure enough, she made the calls. Two days later, I checked my email. I get a message from the director of the Royal Archives and the Imper director of the Imperial War Museum in London. And guess what they say? Debbie called. <laughs> she said, you're her buddy, and we're supposed to help you. What can we do for you? Now, Rhonda, I wanted to tell them to screw themselves because I spent weeks and weeks and weeks begging, but I couldn't say that. Plus, I'm a nice guy, and I lead a civility initiative on campus. So I explained to them what I think I found. Get this, two days after that, four days after talking to Deborah, they contacted me and said, Eureka, we found a large box of highly classified top secret documents in the basement of the Royal Archives. And it was marked on the side of the box, get this, do not open until 2045. Do I have everyone's attention? Yeah, I thought so. So with that, let's, let's roll. Um, so here we go. So what's the crazy story that, that I found that was in this box? And they sent me all the, they declassified everything and sent it to me. And I even, you know, it was the ninth inning of the World Series, and I figured I'd swing for the fence. So I told them, listen, I need you to declassify everything, send everything to me, and nobody else gets it until I finish with it. Guess what they said? Okay. <laughs> so I picked myself up off the floor, and I spent weeks going through hundreds of pages. Here's what I found. What you're looking at right now, it looks like the Titanic, doesn't it, everybody? Uh, it's the Cap Arcona. C-A-P-A-R-C-O-N-A, -A -A, named for Cape Arcona, which is in north central Germany on the southern Baltic coast. And um, it was a magnificent uh, ocean liner built in 1927 by the German company uh, Blum and Voss, which is still in business. They build some of the world's greatest yachts and operated by Hamburg, South America or Hamburg Sud, S-U-D, which is still in business. Um, and it was considered one of the most beautiful and celebrated ships of the 1920s and 30s. Here's a poster. Uh, you can see the specs. She would be equivalent to the Queen Mary II today in size and opulence, similar to the Titanic. The difference is this ship only had three funnels. The Titanic had four smokestacks, but almost similar in size and opulence. You know, the grand chandelier, the grand staircase, the ballroom, the seven course dinners, right? Um, so uh, it was a remarkable, remarkable ship known as the Queen of the South Atlantic or the Floating Palace. She made over 90 transatlantic crossings from Germany, typically Hamburg, all the way to South America. She went to Rio, uh, Uruguay, and uh, Buenos Aires. Argentina. Here's some pictures of the ship. You can see uh, the staircase uh, in the top center, A-list Hollywood actresses, models, uh, European mo uh, diplomats, monarchs, aristocrats, millionaires, all traveled on her. Uh, you can see there she had a, uh, a heated pool, uh, tennis courts, uh, quite something. So that's the uh, Cap Arcona. Now, all that would change in 1939. In 1939, of course, World War II begins. A year earlier, without firing a shot, Hitler gobbled up uh, Czechoslovakia and Austria. He wanted the 
resource rich coal and, and ores and all that of, of those countries to help fuel the Nazi war machine. But on September 1st, uh, 1939, with the Blitzkrieg invasion, uh, he invaded, attacked uh, Poland, uh, which rolled over in just days. Now, Hitler did not want to lose his, uh, this beloved ship. Uh, it turns out that all the Nazi leaders, uh, Hitler, uh, Heinrich Himmler, uh, Joseph Goebbels, uh, Karl Dönitz, uh, the head of the Kriegsmarine, the Nazi Navy, they all loved big ships. And they were crazy about the Cap Arcona. They called her the Nazi Titanic because she looked like the, the Titanic. That's where the title of my book comes from and the title of this lecture. So they called her the Nazi Titanic. So Hitler could not bear the thought of his ship being blown up or sunk during the war. So they moved her to the Baltic coast. And there she sits in 1939. They stripped all the fancy paint off of her, took out the silk and Persian carpets and chandeliers and gold trimming, took all that out, and they let her rust on the Baltic coast. They used her as a floating naval training platform, a barracks for young naval cadets. On the left, I have a map of the Pomeranian, the, the Polish coast there, near present-day Gdansk and Gdynia. Uh, back then, the Nazis, the Germans renamed it Gottenhofen. And why did they put her there? Because the Southern Baltic, um, here's your World War II history, was pretty much the last part of Europe to be destroyed. So it was untouched through most of the war. And that way, Hitler could have his beloved Nazi Titanic. So uh, there she sat until 1942. In 1942, something happened. In a rare moment of rationality and lucidity, uh, Hitler uh, had a meeting with uh, Joseph Goebbels, who you're looking at in the center of the screen, his director of the Ministry of Propaganda and Public Enlightenment. Uh, and Hitler says to Goebbels, we're going to lose the war. Uh, it had turned dramatically on all three fronts. On the Western front, uh, they had gobbled up France successfully, the lowlands of Belgium and Luxembourg and the Netherlands. Uh, they seized uh, Norway, uh, North, you know, and so forth. But they wanted to take the British Isles. And that didn't happen, thank God. Operation Sea Lion. Uh, first, they were going to bomb Britain back to the Stone Ages with the Luftwaffe, the Nazi Air Force. Uh, but And then they were going to invade the British Isles, and that would be the end of things. And history would have been different. However, in one of the greatest upsets in history, a small number of British pilots defeated much of the Nazi Air Force. Uh, you know, if they fought that battle for Britain, Battle of Britain, as, as Churchill called it, if they fought it 10 times, I think Britain would have lost nine out of the 10. But they pulled off the upset and Hitler called off the invasion of the British Isles, thank God. In, their, in the Southern theater, uh, North Africa, even the Nazi Germany's, uh, their best commander, Erwin Rommel, Field Marshal Rommel, the so-called Desert Fox was defeated in North Africa. In the Eastern Front, the Eastern theater, Operation Barbarossa, in the summer of 1941, the Nazis invaded the Soviet Union. And that was really the beginning of the end, everybody. Uh, they were initially successful and inflicted unimaginable casualties on the Soviet army, the Red Army, and the Soviet people. Uh, the Soviets lost more people than the Americans, the British, the Canadians, the Australians, and New Zealanders put together. Uh, but the Nazis were victims of their own success. They penetrated so deep into Soviet territory, but then a bitterly cold winter uh, followed. And the Soviet Union was basically a third world country at the time. They had very little on infrastructure, roads, bridges. And the Nazis were deep in Soviet territory without winter clothing, adequate food, weaponry, armaments, uh, ammo, resupplies. And the Nazi uh, Wehrmacht, the army, tried to resupply but couldn't get there. And entire divisions of the Nazi army froze to death, died, starved, or were captured. Thank God. Uh, so all three fronts went, went south. So Hitler meets with Goebbels and says, I'm tasking you, Joseph Goebbels, to come up with a new front in this war. It will be a propaganda front. 
you need to come up with some diabolical propaganda scheme that will turn the tide of the war. It will make the world love us, the Nazis, and hate the allies. Now, what was this thing? They didn't know. They didn't know what it was, but, but Goebbels had to come up with it. What Hitler and Goebbels did know was movies, movies. Joseph Goebbels made hundreds of propaganda films. You're looking at two of his most infamous, Jud, Jud Seuss, uh, uh, Seuss the Jew, in other words, on the left, and Dare Vigor Jude, the eternal Jew. Now, all of Joseph Goebbels' movies were similar. They were sophomoric at best ham-fisted, juvenile attempts at propaganda. For instance, they all had a theme that there would be an idyllic little German hamlet in Bavaria, and then a Jew would move in, and everything would go wrong. And the guy always looked like Dracula or the devil, as you can see from these propaganda posters. And the people of the town would rise up, like in every Dracula movie, with pitchforks and torches and drive the Jewish guy out of town, and then everybody lived happily ever after. So Hitler and Goebbels loved movies, and they made a lot of propaganda movies. Here is a, um, uh, an example of one of them, probably the, the most famous propaganda film ever made, and the second most expensive. The most expensive is the one we're going to talk about, Rhonda, the one you and I were talking about before the program. So uh, Triumph of the Will, that's Lenny Riefenstahl, uh, in the picture there. This is one of the grand Nazi party rallies and Hitler had her film it uh, to glorify Nazi Germany. And as you can see in the bottom right, the film, although despicable and difficult to watch for obvious reasons, is a masterpiece of cinematography. These massive sweeping crowd scenes. Riefenstahl uh, ushered in new types of cinematography, having her cameraman dresses soldiers and march in the crowd. So you feel as you're watching it, like you're goose stepping with thousands of Nazi soldiers. She would develop um, like these uh, cameras, small cameras and put them on train tracks. So the camera could shoot by at these zooming sweeping scenes. Um, when Hitler and Goebbels and Himmler would give speeches, uh, they were all, let us say, vertically challenged. So when they would stand at the podium, what she did was she dug like a trench at the base of the podium and filmed up to make them look taller. The opening scene in the movie is uh, Hitler's plane appears out of the sun and clouds like a messiah and comes down to greet the people who all run up crying as he walks out with the sun glaring in the behind him as the messiah. Um, and then like the beginning of Star Wars, those big block letters come up the screen. Uh, you know, in a land long ago, a great messiah emerged named Adolf Hitler, you know, that kind of thing. Anyway, so this is the propaganda film. Um, Hitler and Goebbels, their three favorite movies, as best as I could tell, were King Kong, Gone with the Wind, and uh, From the File of You Can't Make This Crap Up, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. I kid you not. They watch these movies all the time. They love these movies. The movie they hated the most, according to surviving letters, was Casablanca, right? Because it was, uh, it, Casablanca was basically an anti-Nazi propaganda film wrapped up in a great story, great acting, and great, you know, dialogue. It's an action, drama, romance hybrid. And they hated Casablanca. So what happened was, Hitler and, 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 and Goebbels were one day watching a movie um, and somebody's writing on the screen, please try to not uh, touch your screen there. We're getting scribble all over the screen, everybody. If you could uh, just uh, you know, try to touch the keyboard or, or not advance it. Um, that way we won't have scribble all over the screen. So um, Hitler and Goebbels one day were, were watching uh, movies and something horrible happened, uh, but it was also the Eureka moment. Hitler and Goebbels would spend hours debating the film after every movie. They considered themselves to be connoisseurs of fine film. They thought they were Germany's Siskel and Ebert, okay? And when I tell my students that, they have no idea who Siskel and Ebert were, okay? Hell, they don't know who Goebbels was, Goebbels was or Himmler. But um, um, so, 
they would sit for hours. One day, Gilbles wrote that they watched a movie that left them so emotionally drained that they couldn't debate it. They just sat and slumped in their chairs, Gilbles said, and watched the credits run. Isn't that what happened to all of you when you saw Schindler's List or Saving Private Ryan, everybody? That's what happened to me. I, I, I usually talk about the movies with whomever I go with, but I was just so emotionally drained. Or like when I saw Frozen, right? I just couldn't bring myself to debate it after seeing Frozen. So unfortunately, Goebbels never said what the movie was, but here's what he said. When they watched the script, the, the credits run, Hitler realized that all the cinematographers, directors, producers, actors were what? Jews. And Goebbels said that Hitler and Goebbels, they kicked over every chair in the viewing studio when they found that out and they were livid. But that's when Hitler had his idea. That's it. I found out the propaganda thing that Goebbels is going to do to help us win the war. You're going to make the greatest propaganda movie in history that will make the world love us and hate the allies. That's it. Now, Goebbels didn't know what the movie was, but he found out there was a Nazi script writer named Brat with two T's who was working on a script for the Titanic long before James Cameron. He knew that everybody was fascinated with the Titanic. So they got that script and they decided they would not make the Titanic. They'd make what? The Nazi Titanic. Uh, they already had a star for the movie. Didn't Nazi Germany have a replica of the Titanic? Yeah, sitting in the Baltic. So they repainted her, the Cap Arcona. They put the chandeliers, everything back in the ship, and they were going to film it on the ship. They got the most handsome. And here's a picture of Hitler and, and Goebbels and others looking at some early uh, runs of it. They got the most handsome matinee actors, the most beautiful models. They got the best um, uh, set designers. Um, they reassigned, even though they're in the middle of the war, get this. Hitler reassigned entire military units to be extras. He wanted one of those Cecil B. DeMille-esque cast of thousands, right? And my students have no idea who Cecil B. DeMille is, okay? <laughs> you get a trend here? Um, so uh, this is what they're going to do. But they had a problem. They had no director. It turns out all of Germany's great directors were Jewish and were all killed or in the concentration camps. But they finally found a director. His name was Herbert Selpin, S-E-L-P-I-N. Now, Selpin, in some ways, was an odd pick to be a director because he was not a loyal Nazi and he was very artsy. But in other ways, they were desperate and he was a perfect pick. Why? Because Hitler did not want Goebbels to make another ham-fisted, sophomoric, obvious propaganda film. Here's what Hitler wanted. He wanted something like Casablanca. He wanted the action, drama, romance hybrid. And what did Herbert Selpin make? Action, drama, romance hybrids. I went back and watched one of his movies uh, in anticipation of writing this book uh, many years ago. It was called Peterson. Uh, and it was basically Indiana Jones. It was about a dashing professor. And hey, everybody, aren't they all? <laughs> it's about a dashing professor. You know it. You know it. Nerdy is the new chic, right? A, a dashing professor who goes to Africa, fights the locals, finds the treasure, gets the girl. Isn't that Indiana Jones? Uh, so they hired Herbert Selpin to make the movie. Here's uh, the movie they're making. On the bottom right, you see my cursor with the round glasses and the ascot? That's Selpin looking just like a director. The rugged guy next to him is the handsome lead actor. There's Selpine on the top right. You can see he's knee deep in water during the sinking scene. That's the radio operator doing SOS as the ship's sinking. On the top right, that's the captain of the White Star Lines and a millionaire passenger. Uh, and the bottom left is the, is the poster they were gonna release for the movie. Um, so that's the movie they were gonna make. Selpine was known as the hedgehog. He was uh, gifted, brilliant, but really difficult, really artsy fartsy kind of a thing. So um, that's the movie they're going to make. Here's what happened. The movie ran over budget. It was running behind schedule. And Hitler was leaning on Goebbels 
So Goebbels leaned on Selpine. Selpine shows up on set one day under massive pressure, basically a gun to his head. He's been drinking and everything went wrong. One of the lead actresses gets pregnant from one of the soldiers that was on, on set as an extra. Uh, Selpine wanted to film the sinking of the ship at night. Why? For realism. The Titanic sunk at night. The problem, if you want to film at night, you need to light up the whole set with those big like Hollywood ballyhoo lights. They lit up the set and the allies bombed it. So everything went wrong. Selpine starts cursing. He curses the Nazis. He curses Hitler. He curses the, curses the army. Well, you know that the SS and Gestapo are everywhere. Selpine gets summoned to Berlin to see Goebbels taken in the basement. And this is what happens to him. They hang him. They hang the director and kill the director. Surprisingly, they had trouble finding another director. Nobody wanted to take over the movie. I wonder why. They finally found a B director named Werner Klingner who finished the movie. So Goebbels finally gets to watch his long awaited classic, the Titanic, and he's watching it. This is the old poster from, uh, they filmed it in 42, the release in 43. And Goebbels is shocked. It's filled with propaganda, but guess what? Also anti-Nazi propaganda. From the grave, Selpine, the director, had the last laugh. Goebbels realizes that the movie is about a fanatical captain who wouldn't listen to anyone, i.e. Hitler, who runs his ship into an iceberg, i.e. the German state into World War II, and everybody dies, i.e. Germany's done. So after all that, he orders that every copy of the movie be destroyed. Fortunately for history, some pirated copies made it to Prague and Paris. And Rhonda and I have watched the film with English subtitles, and it's hard to watch, but the direction and filming are absolutely brilliant. Um, I think it's better than James Cameron's Titanic, even though I think Cameron's a gifted director. Uh, and I've never been a DiCaprio guy, but um, he looks like he's eight. I just can't take him seriously in any role. Um, but um, I think the best Titanic movie ever made, if you'll agree with me, is A Night to Remember. Do you remember the British classic in black and white from the late 50s? Anybody? Anybody remember? You don't have to admit that you're old enough to remember. You can say that you watched it a few years ago. So um, here's why A Night to Remember is so good. For all the ship and sinking scenes, guess what? They use the footage from the Nazi Titanic. Goebbels no longer had copyright. So look at the scene here of the sinking. That's actually the Nazi Titanic. You're looking at her. This is in the movie. Here they are lowering the lifeboats. That's from the actual Nazi movie when they lowered the real lifeboats. When I watched A Night to Remember again, and I watched the old film, I had goosebumps the entire movie. It's the Nazi Titanic, everybody. Hitler and Goebbels were hoping they were going to blow the ship up and sink it for realism. They were hoping people would die and drown. That would make the movie more powerful. This is how sick they were. Um, at any rate, so after the movie, uh, which never you know, was fully finished and copies were destroyed. So let's fast forward now to 1945, and we'll get to the end of this. In 1945, in the spring of 45, beginning in February, but running through uh, March and April, it was one of the most notorious and difficult periods in world history. Why? Hitler issued his liquidation decree. Hitler ordered that any concentration camp not yet liberated should be destroyed. He wanted all evidence destroyed. That meant the camp, the papers, and everybody in the camp. Um, and a lot of concentration camp commandants responded by just killing everybody. Again, it's, it's really a, a, an absolutely murderous and bloody part of our history. However, Heinrich Himmler enters our story, the Gestapo and concentration camp uh, uh, commander. Himmler contacts concentration camp commandants and he tells them, if your camp is not yet liberated or not yet li liquidated, Here's what I want. Don't let anybody fall into allied hands. Now, what does that mean? That's cryptic. Himmler is cryptic for a reason. And this is what was in these classified documents. Um, Himmler 
knew that if he told the concentration camp commandants to save people, that Hitler would have him killed. Why would Heinrich Himmler want thousands of concentration camp survivors and POWs saved? Here's why. He ordered them all marched to the camp you're looking at on the screen, Neuengamma, N-E-U-E-N-G-A-M-M-A. -E -E -M -M it was a very large brick-making concentration camp in Hamburg, north central Germany near the Baltic coast. So thousands and thousands of POWs and concentration camp survivors are marched in a gruesome death march uh, in March of 45 to Neuengamma. Thousands die on the way. Once there, what do they do? They're told to go to the Baltic coast. Most are marched to the Baltic coast and thousands more die. Some are loaded in the cattle cars and taken by train to the Baltic coast, 60 kilometers away. Others are put in, in barges and sailed up one of the rivers to the Baltic coast. What are they gonna do at the Baltic coast? Heinrich Kimmler has an idea. He wants a ship to come to the Baltic coast and he wants to fill the ship with thousands of POWs and concentration camp survivors. He then wants to board the ship and sail it to meet with Churchill, Montgomery, Truman, or Eisenhower. And he wants to negotiate a deal. I will give you thousands of concentration camp survivors and POWs if you save my life and if you conduct a separate conditional surrender on the Western Front. <coughs> That's madness. We would never accept a conditional surrender. What did Truman say? Unconditional, no discussion. Now, what ship does Heinrich Himmler want brought to the Baltic to load everybody up on? There is only one ship, the Nazi Titanic, the Cap Arcona. Plus it's big enough to fill with all those thousands and thousands of people. So they gas her up and they sail her to uh, Lubick Bay, which is near the port of Neustadt, N-E-U, Stadt, New City, Neustadt. Uh, and there in March and April, thousands of people are loaded up onto the ship. It's a gruesome, gruesome scene. The descriptions are they would have these, the ship is so big that she can't dock at the port. She has to drop anchor three kilometers out. That's how big she is like the Titanic. So all day for a couple of days, as we get into May and the war's ending, they're taking shuttles out with 100, 500 POWs and concentration camp survivors. They load them up on the ship, but then they bring 50 dead bodies back. And an hour later, they take another 300 out and they bring 75 dead bodies back. Then they take 500 out and they throw 200 overboard. It's, this is what's going on through May as the war is ready to end. A, a, a macabre scene. Now, once we get into May, um, no one knows what to do. And word arrives that Hitler committed suicide, April 30th, as I said earlier. Uh, Eva Braun, his new wife, committed suicide. Hitler even killed his favorite dog, his German shepherd, Blondie. Joseph Goebbels committed suicide. Goebbels' wife committed suicide. They killed their six children holding teddy bears in their pajamas at night. Heinrich Himmler goes on the run, gets caught, and would later commit suicide. Hermann Göring, the Air Force commander, goes on the run, gets caught, commits suicide. So it's chaos. There's two Nazi officials at the port on the Baltic coast. The one on the left with the Fuhrer is Karl Kaufmann with a K and a K. The one on the right is he's kind of like the mayor, if you will, or the governor of the Baltic coast. The guy on the right in the SS uniform, that's Count George von Basewitz Bear, B-E-H-R, like the paint. He's the head intelligence Gestapo official at the port. These two meet and they say, the war's over. The Fuhrer's dead, we've lost. We have thousands and thousands of people at the port. What do we do? And this is what they decided. Let's fill the ship, the Nazi Titanic with gas, the fuel. Let's load everybody up in it and let's blow it up. We'll put this ship on the bottom of the Baltic. Many, many more people will die on the Nazi Titanic than the Titanic. And the world will forget about the Titanic and always remember our beloved Nazi Titanic. We will deny the allies 
the Fuhrer's favorite ship. And as a final F you to the world, we will kill thousands of concentration camp survivors at the end of the war. That was the plan. On May 3rd, as the war is ending, at uh, uh, 1430 uh, or 230 PM, as they're getting ready to blow the ship up, the British Sixth Commando arrives at the Baltic. Do you remember the letter from General Mills Roberts that I talked about earlier, everybody, a couple of hours ago when I started this long talk? <laughs> I think it was uh, last week I started the talk. Um, General Mills Roberts, they march in the Sixth Commando. Now, the Nazis at the coast defending this, they weren't the regular Wehrmacht, the military. They were the Volkssturm, a couple of old men and little boys, Hitler Youth with old antiquated guns. So the, the British Sixth Commando and the Scottish make quick work out of them. They wipe them out, they liberate the town. Thousands of prisoners on board the ship hear the commotion, they hear the gunfire, they're cheering. Thousands of prisoners on the port are cheering, the people in the town are, and the, the prisoners and concentration camp survivors yell and tell the British, you gotta go out to that giant ship three kilometers out there there's thousands and thousands of people there and they're dying by the hundreds every hour. So right when the British are ready to sail out and rescue everybody on the ship, they hear a deafening roar. It's from these planes. These are Mark, excuse me, Mark, Mark 1B typhoons, um, like the storm typhoons. They're not as big as a B-17 or B-24 bomber or a British Lancaster, if you know your bombers, but they're not small like an American P-51 Mustang or a British Spitfire. They're in between, they're mid-range. So they can fight and bomb. Uh, they specialize in attacking tanks, trains, and ships. Look at the one on the right. They're carrying, you see on the wings, twin 50s. You see those massive machine guns? They shoot bullets the size of a tube of toothpaste. It's many per second. You see that rocket underneath? A 60 pound, six foot long rocket. Do you also see those clasps underneath her belly, the fuselage? They carry a 500 pound bomb. So the British are ready to go save everybody on the Nazi Titanic and they hear a deafening roar. They look up in the air and the sky blackens. Six squadrons of these typhoons fly in and they see the Nazi Titanic and they blow her up. Such explosions with all these 500 pound bombs and 60 pound rockets. And remember the ship's filled with fuel. The ship is lifted up out of the water, breaks apart and goes back in the water. People three kilometers away on the port were blown over by the concussion blast. Thousands are killed instantly in the ship. Thousands more are blown overboard. The Baltic Sea is 42 degrees Fahrenheit in May. They survived concentration camps. They survived two death marches. They survived days without food or water, locked in the holds of the ship. People died instantly of hypothermia or drowned. To make matters worse, those that were hanging on to something that floated you see the twin, the twin 20s on the wings? These, these planes then, after bombing the Nazi Titanic, strafed, they strafed the survivors in the water. Then they raced down the port where there's thousands of people in striped pajamas like this. And they raced down strafing the people at the port. One of the pilots whose records were in the box of declassified documents I read, his name was Alan Weisse, W-Y-S-E. And he said, we shot those chaps up at the port. He described torsos being cut in half by the mass of bullets. Once they blew up the ship, killed everybody in the water, killed everybody at the port, they flew back to, um, uh, to, their, uh, to their port, uh, to their uh, uh, barracks. This is, constitutes perhaps the single bloodiest hour of the entire war and Holocaust. Remarkably, a couple of people survived. You're looking at one of them, Beric Jakubowicz. 
Polish, as the name would suggest. Beric and his little brother, Jozek, survived concentration camps, including Auschwitz. They were marched to Noyangama. They survived that. Then they were marched from Noyangama to the Baltic. They survived that. These two little boys were put in the deep, deep bottom of the Nazi Titanic with hundreds of people. They were ankle deep in urine and feces with nothing to eat or drink and no light for a couple of days. Most everybody had died. When the ship was hit by the typhoon bombers, it tore a gaping hole in the side, which filled with frigid water. Anybody still alive died or drowned. The two brothers, Jakubovic brothers, are treading water. And as the water's filling up in the hold, it's going up to the ceiling. The problem is the ceiling above them, the hatches are closed. So as the boys are getting to the ceiling, they're taking their last breath, the hatch opens up at the ceiling. Some brave Holocaust survivors from the top deck risked their lives and went below deck and reached down and pulled the two Jakubovic brothers up. Everybody else is dead. They then go running through the ship. Now the ship's rolling over. So to get to the top, you got to go to the bottom, right? Like in the Poseidon adventure, remember Ernest Borgnine and Shelley Winters? Was that, am I getting that right? Am I dating myself? None of my students have ever heard of the Poseidon adventure. Um, so, or Ernest Borgnine or Shelley Winters. Um, uh, for that matter, Johnny Carson or anyone, right? Um, so they're, they're running through fire and, and holding their breath underwater and, and they get to one hallway and flames are shooting down the hallway. They're trapped. One brother gets on the shoulders, Jozek gets on Barrett's shoulders and there's, a, there's a, a, an air vent. They climb out through the air vent and when they climb out through the air vent, uh, they reach down to help the people that rescued them and all those people were incinerated by fire. The brothers get to the top deck and the ship is now on its side. Beric says, I'm jumping overboard. Jozek says, I can't swim. Jozek decides to shimmy onto the bottom of the ship. Beric jumps overboard. They give their brotherly goodbyes and they go. Beric is saved by a German fisherman who plucks him out of the water, naked and freezing and dying. The fisherman takes Beric to town to a bakery. There's no food in the bakery, but they can light the oven and he wraps up in burlap sacks with a couple of other people the fishermen save. The fisherman is so afraid of the Nazis, he won't give Beric his name. I've tried to find out the fisherman's name so I could go to Yad Vashem and have him listed as among the, the righteous among us, a righteous Gentile, but we don't know his name. In the morning, Beric is awakened because the door of the bakery is kicked open. He thinks the Nazis are there to finish him. It's the British. They rescue Barrack. They take him to the local hospital and dress him. Guess who's in the hospital? His brother, Jozak. The night before the British went out to the ship, Jozak was hanging onto the, the bottom of the ship. Now, the engines are on fire, the boiler room. So the, the ship, the metal was so hot, it was cooking people alive. What Jozak did was pile up the dead people and sat on top of them. He had burns, but he lit him. Barrick and Jozek are rescued. They move to Boston. They get married. They have kids and they live long, good lives. Died years, several years ago. I talked six years ago, seven years ago, and I was writing a book. I talked to Barrick's widow. There was another survivor, Francis Akos, A-K-O-S. He was Hungarian. As a teenager, he was a violinist for the Budapest Jewish Philharmonic. He survived multiple concentration camps, survived the death march to Noyangama, survived the death march to the sea, survived days on the ship. When it was blown up, he and others were blown into the water. He's picked out of the water by some Nazis in a boat. They realize he's a concentration camp survivor, so they throw him back in the water. He swims three kilometers to the shore. Everybody, he survived the Holocaust. He was skin and bones, starving in the frigid water. Michael Phelps could not swim three kilometers to the shore. Acos does. 
As he's ready to get out of the water, a group of naval cadets and Hitler youth run up to the coast. There's a bunch of Holocaust survivors on the edge of the water, too weak to stand. And they're machine gunned by all the kids. Akos goes back in the water and is treading water. This is superhuman, everybody. He can't tread water anymore. He comes to shore. And as he's walking to town, he hears behind him, hands up, criminal. He and others, hands up. It's some young Hitler youth. As he's ready to die, he hears machine gun fire and the Hitler youth kids crumble in front of him. It's General Mills Roberts who wrote that letter I found and the sixth commando. Mills Roberts said it was his only time in his life in uniform that he was not an officer and a gentleman. There would be no surrender. He told his men to tear the Germans apart limb by limb. And they did. And they took Francis Akos to the hospital and saved him. And he moved to Chicago and became the first chair principal violinist for the Chicago Symphony. Retired as the concert master. Considered to be an Itzhak Perlman virtuoso. I've listened to his music. I talked to him on the phone before he died about seven years ago. Talked to his daughter, Katie, who was the concert master for the San Francisco Symphony. Uh, these people lived extraordinary lives and managed to survive this. Here's a picture that the British pilots took of the Nazi Titanic when they were bombing her. She rolls over and sinks. It's the stories forgotten as the British classify everything, top secret, a 100 year secret, not to be open until 2045. Thankfully, they declassified the documents. I went to Hebrew University uh, and gave a lecture about it. Here's the only marker to it, a small little grave saying 7,000 people died. We don't even know how many died. I estimate somewhere between 4,500 and 7,500 on the ship. There were three other ships, the Deutschland, the Thielbeck, and the Aten. Two of those three were blown up as well. I estimated another four to 5,000 died on those. Several thousand died at the port, and several thousand died at the death march. You could have 25,000 dead, making this the worst incident of the war. It was all classified because the British were so horrified by what they did as we were as they were surrendering uh, that they sealed everything until the year 2045. Now, how could this, there's the book, how could this have happened? Um, the fog of war. Uh, the British pilots that hit uh, the Nazi Titanic at 2.30 p.m. on May 3rd were 18 and 19 years old. The British were running out of pilots. They put young boys in the cockpit. Many of them had only hours or days of training. They were scared to death. It was cloudy, raining, no one could see. They fired everything they had at the biggest ship they ever saw and flew home. I think most of them didn't know what they did. You and I know the difference between an ocean liner and a battleship. However, there was a rumor that the Nazis were gonna to try to flee to Norway for one last stand, a final redoubt. And guess what, everybody? After the war, they found over a hundred Nazi U-boats in the deep fjords of Norway. They were gonna use the cold weather mountains and geographic isolation to dig in for one final stand. So these pilots said a ship that size and it was low in the water because it was filled with people and fuel, they thought to escape. They, they, they blew it up so the Nazis couldn't escape. Um, this constitutes the world's worst instance of friendly fire, the bloodiest hour of the war, the last tragedy of World War II, and one of many heinous crimes of the Holocaust, and it was forgotten from history. In order for the words never again and never forget to have resonance, we need to dig, dig, dig and find every story we can and share it with every generation. Uh, otherwise, we don't honor those who were lost, honor those who survived, and make sure that something like this doesn't happen again. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Watson. That was an incredible story, incredible but sad. Um, I'm gonna read you some questions on the chat, but I, I did have one question. 
Um, I was also reading about the Nazi Titanic and earlier in the war, was it used to house or transport German soldiers around 1943? Rhonda, you're on top of the curve. Yes, uh, <laughs> once again, I was going to talk about that, but I, I good gracious, I went on for 55 minutes. Yeah. So okay. yeah, not this ship, the Nazi Titanic. So when I wrote the book, I decided to make the ship, I guess the protagonist or antagonist, depending on how you look at it. Um, this ship was the star of the most expensive propaganda film in history. It was for 20 years, the world's most celebrated ocean liner. It was a replica of the Titanic. It was built to look like the Titanic. Um, it was the, the, the source of the world's most gruesome maritime tragedy, but it was also part of the largest uh, rescue or exodus in history. When the Red Army, you're right, Rhonda, when the Russians were marching across Eastern Europe, it was payback. The Soviets were committing utterly gruesome, unimaginable, inhumane crimes the way the Nazis did to them. Cutting people's arms off, throwing them in lakes, uh, nailing people to barn doors, crucifying them and shooting them, just uh, throwing them in with pigs that hadn't been fed and letting the pigs eat them alive. So, so you had thousands of German soldiers, German civilians, Polish civilians, uh, anybody from the East, all running for their lives because their Soviets were killing and murdering and raping everybody they encountered. They made it to the Baltic coast, Rhonda, and the German Navy sent this ship over, along with other ships, to rescue everybody and sail them to Copenhagen. This ship and other ships were filled with, with uh, refugees and sailing. The problem was the Soviet submarines were sitting right off the coast waiting for them. It was like shooting fish in a barrel. The other ships were sunk and thousands and thousands of refugees were killed. Anyone that survived, the Soviet subs would surface and machine gun the survivors, women, children, civilian, anybody. One of the few ships that made it was this one. Why? Her, her halls were reinforced so it wouldn't be sunk like the Titanic. And literally mines and torpedoes bounced off her halls or exploded and did no damage. Also, she was so fast, the captain just opened her up and the subs couldn't catch her. She went over, back, over, back, three times filled with people and rescued tens of thousands of people and the Soviet subs could never catch her. So yeah, this ship was... Um, truly one of the most remarkable and notorious and infamous and bizarre ships, maybe the most bizarre ship in history. So yeah, and, and many other stories, which I didn't have time to get to, but yeah, you're right, Rhonda. So she was in, uh, part of that rescue mission um, from uh, the Polish coast. Um, if anybody has any questions, put them in the chat, please. There was one question about the memorial to the survivors. Why was there a cross on the memorial when many of the people that were killed were Jewish? Most of the people that were killed were Jewish, the lion's share, the lion's share. And again, we don't have an accurate number. In the back of the book, I put together uh, some estimates based on all my reading and the best guesses, uh, but the lion's share were Jewish. That, of, of that, I'm certain because it was some local Germans at the coast who put it up, so they put a cross. It's a very small, understated marker in Neustadt, a sleepy fishing village, and nobody knows about it. Um, you know, uh, it, I, certainly it deserves a much better memorial uh, than my book and then that little marker. Uh, let us hope that uh, something much bigger and much more suitable uh, is, is is put together one of these years, so yeah. Okay, thank you. Another question is, do you think there are other untold significant stories of the Holocaust, such as the one you just told that you can write about maybe? Yeah, there's no question. Um, you know, Karen and Marilyn and, 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 and Roberta and, and uh, Donna, folks that hear me all the time, and probably you, Rhonda, you've, you've suffered through my lectures also. I love them, uh, I love them. You've, uh, Bobby's heard this. What do I say all the time? I always say there's more we don't know about history than we do. Richard's heard this a thousand times. Um, I open all my classes on campus by saying that, uh, and I mean it. Uh, you know, 99% of all the books that have ever been written are lost, burned, decomposed. 
99% of the love letters, the poems, the recipes, the war reports, it's all gone. Um, now, just a couple of years ago, you all remember this. A couple of years ago, they found several satellite camps from major concentration camps. How could they have been hidden for over 70 years? They just found, I mean, they found the documents. A couple of weeks ago, everybody, they found a 90 some year old Nazi guard. Yeah. And they, they sent him to Israel. Guess where he was a guard? Noyen Gama, the camp they took everybody. And guess what he did? He marched the people to the Baltic to put them on the Nazi Titanic. And the records of the people that survived said the guards were absolutely inhumane. The guards were scared to death because they knew the war was ending and they could hear the gunfire and allied planes were flying overboard, overhead. The guards were racing people to the Baltic. Imagine surviving the Holocaust and, and, and having the race. One person uh, who survived wrote in, in, his, in his letters, which were in that box, oh, those boxes, he wrote that one person with me had to go to the bathroom. They stepped out of line to urinate and the guards shot him on the spot. They said another person just tripped and fell and the guards shot him on the spot. The guards wanted to get him to the Baltic, load him on the ship, and many guards took their uniforms off, put on civilian clothing and ran like hell. So we just found this guy a couple of weeks ago. Yes, yes, without question. There's, and I'm not a conspiracy theorist, not even close. I'm the opposite, whatever that is. But of course, no question, there's still stories we don't know. No question. Um, there's several comments in the chat about that this was such a tragic story, but thank you for bringing it to light. Um, Linda Bloomfield wrote an interesting statement. You're the only person I know who can make me laugh and cry at the same time. Oh, Get to all right. the emotions. All my friends say the same thing about me. I have that. Sarah would admit that, right, Sarah? I have that effect on people. My goal in life is to make you laugh a little bit more than crying so, so that all my friends here still talk to me. <laughs> but no, I mean, you know, uh, ma'am, thank you for that nice comment. What, what I try to do as an historian, my job is not only to tell the story, my job is to get out of the way of the story. This story tells itself. My job is to memorize the names, the details, the, the dates, and put it to memory and just share that with you because the story tells itself. And as I always tell my friends and, and, and my buddies on this call have heard this, um, when I teach the Holocaust on campus, when I teach slavery on campus, when I teach D-Day on campus, if my students don't get teary, I was a lousy professor. Uh, I don't want them to be able to eat lunch after my classes. Mm -hmm. I want them to be sick, but I want them to be committed to social justice. So I know my fellow historians, and this is something I've said my whole 30 year career, and I know they're, you know, they would excommunicate me from the fraternity of historians. Uh, and, and I know I, I get this crap all the time. I'm not always neutral when I write. I'm an historian, but I'm also an advocate. This book was written to tell a story, but it was written to make a point. All my books are written to make a point. I'm not biased. I'm 100% factual. If I can't find multiple primary sources, it does not get in print in my books. I'm really nerdy and, and serious about that. You know, if you read my books, there's hundreds and hundreds of citations and sources. And there's 50 facts per page. I'm really, really nerdy about it. But I, I, I see myself as an advocate as much as I'm an historian. This book was written to tell a lost story, but this book was written to try to make sure never again and never forget happened. Mm -hmm. And if I didn't do that, I think I would be wrong. And it would shame on me. So um, yeah. Okay, I have a couple more questions. I know um, it's getting past the time, but if you know you want to stay on, it's great. Um, I have a question from a former teacher, history teacher, Graham Martin. He asked, did the British ever conduct a hearing on this event? Graham, thank you, uh, not only for the question, but for being a, a fellow historian and a fellow educator. 
I admire what you're doing. You're in the trenches. Uh, you're molding them, and then I get them and just put the icing on top of the cake. But um, uh, Till, Major Till, the first letter I told you about, he was asked to do a covert investigation. Keep it quiet. Um, we don't know who tasked him to do this. It had to be very senior. The highest levels of British government or British military. I was not able to find that out. That's gone. But Major Till did do the report, and he was told all the all the uh, pilots that day, everybody on the coast that day, the general, the soldiers. They were told they had to turn everything in, and they were never allowed to talk about this under penalty of the law. Which is, you know, like in Men in Black, they would have given them that buzzer that makes you forget everything. <laughs> um, so um, under penalty. So Major Till did an investigation and filed the report. I've not been able to find the entire report, only a little bit of it. Uh, I've had archivists in the Imperial War Museum and Royal Archives looking for it, and it seems that it's gone or still hidden somewhere. Um, now, what is the good news is I went to Hebrew Union, Hebrew Union, and that was it. And I talked to about 250 rabbis and directors of Holocaust museums a couple JCC and Federation directors, and I told them this story in detail and made copies of everything and handed them out. And the British government's declassified everything, Graham. And you can see it all now in the Imperial War Museum in London, one of my favorite museums, by the way. Um, it's there, it's out. Um, but there's still stuff that we need to find out and we can't find out. Um, you all remember Indiana Jones, everybody? Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah, I watched it a hundred times because I made my own kids watch it so that they got the point that professors are really cool, okay? Like Indiana <laughs> Jones, right? I even put the hat on for the movie. But um, so um, uh, you remember the final scene when they have the, the arc and they put it in a crate and a, a forklift puts it in a basement on like row 73, section L. And there's like, a, there's more stuff in there than there is at a Sam's Club. That's what the, you know, underneath the Smithsonian's everybody, underneath the Library of Congress, underneath the National Archive or the archives in London, I've been to all of them underneath the ground. There's more underground than there is set out. I mean, there's millions and millions of trays, boxes and documents. I don't even know what they have. I don't even know if they know what they have and I'm not a conspiracy theorist. So Graham, it's possible parts of it are still there. Here's the way I pitched it to him, Graham. The war ended. Some 20 year old guy with the forklift was told to load up a lot of boxes on a boat and he filled it with dog tags and all this stuff. They put it on a ship. They took it to Southampton. They loaded it on a lorry or a truck and some other 20 year old guy drove it to London and just threw it in the basement because he wanted to go to a pub and meet a girl or go have his mom cooking dinner. They were sick of the war. And they had millions and millions of items. Was it put away in a coherent manner? No. The stuff that I got was not even organized. I spent three weeks trying to organize it chronologically and then organize it by topic. Do you know in those detective and police movies on the wall, they have all the photos like in Hannibal Lecter and they're connecting them all? What I did was I took everything out of my office and hung a sign on my door that Students weren't allowed to come in my office for about eight weeks. I made my floor a crime scene. I stacked all the papers chronologically and by topic and then re-stacked the move because I had to organize everything before I could figure out what the hell I had. So if a student knocked on the door, I stepped over all the papers and we sat outside. Uh, and then after eight weeks, I had it figured out so I could start typing. Um, so the way I got the documents I think they just threw them in the box. You know what? If I was 20 and I lived through the war and I didn't see my girl for years or my mom, I'd have just thrown them in the box and gone out for a beer and going home for dinner. And I think that's probably what they did. So I'm a Graham. I don't know when we don't know. I hope I hope they're still there and I hope someday somebody finds me. OK, I'm just um, there was a comment from Suzanne. The day um, that there's a book club selection, Salt to the Sea, which tells a similar story of a German ship 
full of refugees torpedoed by the Russians. I don't know if you've heard of that, Dr. Watson. Yeah, it was in the Baltic. It was part of that rescue operation you mentioned, Rhonda. Yep. It was oh, okay. one of the large ships torpedoed and sunk and thousands died and several ships were so oh, Ellen O'Connell's here. Hi, Ellen. Just saw you now. So, um, um, so yeah, it was sunk uh, and, and the Nazi Titanic would have been sunk, but it was too big. The halls were reinforced and it was just way too fast. Again, it was equivalent to uh, one of the modern, wonderful cruise ships that I lecture on all the time. Uh, you know, right, Karen? Uh, and the Simmons family, right? Um, so uh, yeah, I I'm familiar with the book and the incident, yeah. Okay, well, I wanna thank you so much. The friends, thank you. And there's several comments on the chat to thank you for such an interesting and provocative lecture. Just a reminder to everybody next Monday at seven, Dr. Watson will talk about the ghost ship of Brooklyn, an untold story of the American Revolution another horrific story that we don't really know about. We'll so, all cry and we'll all laugh together. Yeah. So thank anyway, you, thanks Robert. again for thank being you. here. Thank you, Dr. Watson. Peace. It was wonderful. Good to see all my friends. Rhonda, thank you. Hannah, Marilyn, thank you. And everybody support the friends of the Sterling Road Library. We're all hurting, but let's support our local libraries. I'm a library nerd. So uh, thanks everyone. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Good to see you. Good to see you too.